There is Lee Wiley that lives on in Barbara's memory, and there is Lee Wiley that lives in Nobuko's imagination. The two Lee Wileys sing together. Lately I find you're on my mind more than you know. <laughs> the, the composer does it three different ways. Uh, <laughs> more than you know, and then more than you'd ever know, and then more than you'd ever know. That's, that's because he's a good composer. I'm thinking of singing this song at the end of the year. I'll be sure to keep in mind what I learned today when I sing the song in December. <laughs> Sugar. As Lee's relationship with the young and gifted musician Victor Young deepened, her sense of music also became increasingly refined. You know, I, I thought for a moment that Victor Young was Giuseppe Tommy. Well, that may not be altogether true, but it is true that there had been someone in Lee's life who influenced her and trained her, someone who told her to take lessons. And like Giuseppe, my husband, I think that he would have been very demanding, very strict. Lee, who probably didn't give an ear to what anybody else said, will listen to him because she absolutely trusted him, had faith in his music, and, and loved him. And, and, and what happened was that she refined her music. I could identify myself in that role, in that kind of relationship. Victor Young had been her mentor. Yes, I believe that's probably what it was. <laughs> Lee's devotion to Victor led to an incident at the height of her career. By this time, a very popular star. Lee insisted on having Victor arrange all of her songs and making it a condition in her contract. However, Paul Whiteman, one of the leading producers and musicians of the time, refused to sign Victor. In an open display of dissatisfaction, Lee turned down the contract. Her attitude infuriated the great Whiteman, who put Lee Wiley's name on his blacklist. This meant that Lee was deprived of finding any work in all of New York City. The girl, who until but a short time before had been a big star, was all but chased out of New York. Lee dropped out of the public eye. As her heart broke, so did her health. She went to a ranch and lived quietly out in the country, Offers to do what she loved most of all to sing stopped coming completely. Finally, Lee headed to California where Victor was staying when the chips were down. Victor Young proved to be Lee's trusted ally, mentor, and an essential part of her life. Following Lee's footsteps, Nobuko flew to California. Lee's brother and his family lived here in San Diego. It is said that Lee, who had never had children, adored her nephews and nieces as if they were her own. Nobuko visited one of Lee's nieces, Theodora, who had spent her childhood with Lee. What had Lee been like as an aunt? And I, I know with me, it seemed like every time I wanted to go to a show or I wanted to go see, I wanted to go see a play on Broadway about Lenny Bruce. 
And she said, he was a horrible man. He had a horrible mouth. <laughs> and you shouldn't go. And I said, but it's a play. I should be able to go. I just, I want to see about him. It's not really him. But I, I miss her a great deal. I would like to ask her things sometimes. Mm -hmm. She's sure to be around somewhere. <laughs> She's around somewhere. I know. I know. Um. Theodore's father was waiting on the lawn in the courtyard. Nobuko went up to meet the man who was Lee's favorite brother. Ted Wiley is 89 years old. He is Lee's youngest brother. <laughs> you remind me so much of Lee. There are things about you that make me cry out. Why, it's Lee. You are making me feel that way. There's one thing about Lee. When she made a friend, you were a friend for life. She was that kind. She was a very true person. It was good to be around her. It was easy, very informal. Uh, she'd do anything for you, you know, make you feel comfortable. Or, An incident in California helped put Lee back on the path to recovery from her despair. Through Victor Young, she was asked one day to appear on a radio program that was open to the public. Although she had all but given up hope of ever singing again in front of an audience, she ventured to give it a try. The audience gave Lee a rousing round of applause. Lee, come on back and take a bow. The subtitle reads, It made me cry. The audience was applauding. There were people who wanted to hear me sing. Lee returned to New York after an absence of nearly a year and a half. No one, however, came to meet the one-time great star. It was like starting over from zero, but there was never a wavering in her decision to start singing again. She'd hit rock bottom. What would have gone through her mind in her despair? That she might never sing again or do what she loved to do most in front of an audience? Would she have pondered over what to do with the rest of her life? These are crucial issues, so it would have been a terrible ordeal for her. But when life hands you a terrible blow, like it did to me once, you think about these things. I thought that I wouldn't be able to make movies, at least not the way I used to, but it is at such times that something totally unexpected happens, like something falling out of the sky that you would never have even considered for yourself before. For me, it was singing. If Juzo had been alive, I would never have sung a duet with Kei Ogura on his television program. Juzo would have advised me not to do it, and I probably would not have. But at that critical time in my life, I decided to give it a try. So I took lessons. Me, who had never sung in front of people and never even had tried karaoke. But when I sang, I was genuinely surprised, and it was a refreshing feeling. I hadn't known there was something in the world that was so much fun. So I discovered a new world outside of acting, which remains, of course, an important world for me. But a new world, 
that I found just after life had delivered me a cruel blow. It turned out that this was something that I could keep on doing and intend to keep on doing.